What's up? Again, it's another Saturday night. We are broadcasted from uh, live from uh, Southern California. I want to give a shout out to uh, all the people listening from Hawaii to Florida. I have a very special guest in the studio today. You guys will know him from uh, the Frank, uh, Frank Sontag show on KKLA. Um, he's here tonight. We're going to be talking about new age and the exit out of uh, that lifestyle. But before we get going, I'm going to have Sean run down a couple of the uh, announcements. Yeah, like Ryan was saying, it's amazing what God's doing, man, with his radio show on 25 stations in seven states now. So, yeah, thank you for all uh, tuning in. Also, you can always watch live at ryan-reese.com. You can watch this streaming uh, through the web. It's a trip. I, I told you a couple weeks ago that there was this guy that called, like, tracking me down at the church. He's like, man, I've been listening to the study, but he was in uh, Pennsylvania. He'd been listening to the show from Pennsylvania, but he was just watching it on his, on his computer. There's so yeah. many little things like that that I'm, like, tripping out on. Um, but also, a lot of stuff's taking place with the whosoever's right now. You know, a few weeks ago, you guys did a couple of high school tours and now I know going into the fall right now, you want to book a bunch of high school tours right now, right, right? Yeah, right now we have a bunch of different teachers uh, giving us a call. I said it about, I think it was like four weeks ago, I was talking about how we went to the high school tours. We went to um, Bowman High School, which was a continuation school. And uh, we actually got a quote back from uh, one of the teachers, from one of the students that walked up to them and said, dude, that was one of the dopest events we've ever had at this high school. We got to go there, do a concert for them, and then just give them a message of hope. And then actually hang out with every single one of them after and basically just give them the book of John. You know, we met with a couple guys that, that believed in different gods or different godheads. And then some of the people that were atheists and one of the girls that was struggling with suicide. So we got to hang out with them, plug them in and uh, just love on them. And then we went to another school down in, um, where was it? San Diego. Uh, what was the name uh, of Chula that? Vista. Chula Vista. Yeah. Which is right down by near Mexico. Yeah. But what was interesting about that school is we got we went there, we shared the gospel. About 80% of the place gave their life to the Lord. But then gotcha. after, there was this girl in a wheelchair with green hair, and she was kind of hanging out. And I remember when I was talking about God, she kept like, she wasn't really responding to it. She was just kind of to herself. So like God kind of gave me an eye for her that day. So I walked up to her after and basically started talking to her. And what happened is she basically tried committing suicide the night before. 16-year-old wow. girl tried committing suicide, and her story was she was driving down the street, and uh, with her parents when she was four months years old and she got hit by a drunk driver and uh, she exited the car at four months and the, the, the cops found her on the side of the road next to the curb. And when they took her in to have her checked out, they took her in to operate on her and they actually cut the wrong, um, wrong cord wow. and basically paralyzed her all the way down. So basically through this life of what, you know, growing up with depression and just being dealt a bad set of cards, uh, she was struggling. She didn't believe God was real. But after talking to her, texting her, sending her movies, sending her different videos and just loving on her and praying for her, she texted me the other day and said, hey, I'm going to church on Sunday. Mm, and, sick. you know, I'm just excited about life. So now she's, she's fired up. She's walking with God. But these high school tours are serious. If you want us to come, give us a call. Email us at the info or info at the whosoever's.com. We're booking for September dates right now, October dates. And our goal is to hit, I mean, as many high schools as possible in Southern California. This is a Southern California deal. Yeah, and many of you guys are going on break right now with the high school. But make sure you do all the footwork now so going into the new year, all these things will be dialed in. Man, you're, you're speaking at more schools than you ever went to school back in the day. I never school. graduated. I know. <laughs> it, 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 what was crazy is when we were going to uh, – when we showed up at that um, continuation school, I walked up and I said, you know what, you guys, to be honest, I go – I feel so at home at this high school because I went to actually continuation school. And it turns out the whole band that was on stage, they all went to continuation school yeah. too. And then Vinny, the guy that flips dirt bikes, Carbone, yeah. he went to a continuation school. It just, it was, it was rad, man. Amazing opportunity. And like Ryan said, we have a special show for you guys. So we're glad that you are tuning in. Uh, Ryan's been on uh, Frank Sontag show many times already, and he's been so hyped talking about about this show, so why don't we just uh, get into it, right? Dude, I know. You know what? It's it's cra Frank. Honestly, it's crazy. I'm a little nervous because I got the big <laughs> gun sitting across from me. It's yeah, like yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to figure out. It'd be like if I was sitting across from like uh, you know. No, just... don't don't even go. Don't even <laughs> don't even stack that kind of pressure on you, dude. I'm I'm honored to be on your show. We had a conversation um a number of months ago after you did my show. Yeah. Just about the idea of you doing a radio show. And God's working. I mean, you're on 20-some stations. Here you are. I'm honored to be on your show. 
Dude, thank you. And it was it was actually we were in your office or in your studio, and I, I remember I said something like, "Hey, um, what do you, what do you think? Do you think maybe if I, if I if I were to get into doing a radio show or something?" And I can't remember what you said, but it really made me check myself and my motives. And I was like, "Yeah, I I, I need to do this. This would be awesome." And then I don't know. I got a phone call. It was months later um, about meeting up, about talking about a radio show, and it's just crazy that we're here. When you asked me that, I knew the answer in my head. The answer was clearly a yes, but I didn't want to tell you that <laughs> because you needed to pray through it. And yeah. obviously the yes is what's happening on your show. It's yeah, blowing up. That's it. No, I know. And, you know, I prayed and I said, God, if you want to do this, oh, just open the doors yeah. wide. Amen. Because we'd had no budget, you know, yeah. and, and next thing you know, God just opens the door in 25 stations and uh, and it's growing. And it's because it's meeting a need that. People, people have these stories that they need to hear. And that's why I want you to come in to talk about your story. Yep. I um, have a story, indeed. You, well, let's, let's talk about your book really quick. Um, you have a book that just came out. It's called Light the Way Home. Tell us a little bit about it and where people can get it. Um, I wrote the book to tell my story of my involvement in the New Age movement. I was a New Age teacher for 21 years. And uh, just steeped in living for myself, living for the world. And uh, my conversion was pretty radical. I'm sure we'll get to that, what happened to me, my testimony. But we wrote it last year to show that uh, New Age Movement's the biggest church in America, Church of Self, um, and what happens to someone's life when God gets a hold of you and you say yes to Him. So the book may sound like it's about me, but it's ultimately about God. And we built a website around it, which is franksontag.net. Yes. Purchase one of those books. I haven't read it yet. I've heard a lot of the story. My wife just finished it and said it's amazing. I'm a slow reader, so it's going to take me a minute. But uh, if you guys have tuned in, you guys are going to hear the story right now, bits and pieces of the Frank Sontag story, him coming out of New Age. So first of all, dude, you um, you worked for a, a, a prominent radio station um, here in L.A. How would you even get into radio? In June of 1984, a buddy of mine that I worked with, I was in the grocery business at the time, working at a grocery store, just throwing cans on a shelf. He pulls up on a motorcycle, and I'm like, whoa, that's, that's nice. Yep. So we had conversation. Uh, two months later, uh, I'd never been on a bike before. I had him buy me a bike. And so that night, we're going to go in the parking lot. He's going to run me through all the gears, and I'm going to ride my motorcycle home. So I bought a motorcycle in the spring of 1984, uh, fell in love with it. Um, In June of 1984, uh, I asked the woman that I was dating at the time to take a motorcycle ride with me to a place that just got blown up last week, literally, or just recently, Hollywood Park, racetrack in Inglewood. Okay. Now, the woman I was dating... Because I was a very uh, young guy that was all after myself in the world. Uh, I'd love to tell you guys and your listeners that I was surprised when I found out she was married. Right. But the truth is, the first time I met her, she told me she was married. And I didn't care. I was young. I had things on my mind that I was interested in that she could provide. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would love to tell your listeners when I found out she was married to a police officer, I was surprised, but I knew that too. And I didn't care. I was so steeped in my sin. You know, the enemy is so seductive. Mm -hmm. People that don't know the Lord that may be listening to the show, um, he had such a stronghold on me. I was living for the world, living for my flesh. And here I am getting on a motorcycle with a married woman, married to a police officer, you know, just carrying on, going on about my business. So, um, and here's what happened. We ride to Hollywood Park. We watch a horse run. His name was the title of the book, Light the Way Home. Uh, It's a great story. Don't have time to go into it, why I named that title. But we go and watch this horse run. um, And then we get back on the motorcycle and go back to my apartment. And on the way back to the apartment, Um, I was on the 101 freeway, a very popular freeway here in SoCal, and I looked in my mirror to make a lane change, and I saw a black car flying up on us. Now, in 84, there were no motorcycle helmet laws, so I didn't have a a bucket on my head. Dang. She didn't, and I looked, and I thought, my last thought was, before impact, was this is it. 
the aftermath of it, Highway Patrol, when they do their police report, you know, uh, chalked it off and, and skid marks and estimated on impact we were hit um, 110 miles an hour. Dude, and, that's crazy. And I'm here to talk about it, but um, it was not a good, good, good time at all. She got hurt very badly. Mm-hmm. I had to call her husband. Uh, she had to have brain surgeries. Um, and it started uh, a time in my life where I realized, and, and me, um, all I had was road rash. Uh, late that night, after everything calmed down, doctor calls me in the back room. They had x-rayed me, and he says, you're, you're a really lucky young man. Hit at 110 miles an hour and road rash, no helmet. Yeah, and I'm thinking, no kidding. Well, what happened? Did you, like, because I, I ride motorcycles, did you hit, like, pop up and do, like, a flip in the air and land? Or, like- I, I flew 90 feet, and then I hit and rolled another 90 feet. And I tried to break the momentum, and that's how I got torn up. But he told me that night, he said, you're lucky, um, no broken bones. So I knew I had a second chance in life. Right. But here's the kicker. Um, I sold everything I had and left L.A. and locked myself in a cabin in Lake Tahoe. Coldest winter, froze my off and yeah. uh, started my quest to figure out what was life about. Right. And the New Age movement of all things opened up to me. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about New Age because New Age is something I've studied. You know, I was telling you I was going through uh, Charlie Campbell and he breaks down all the different religions yep. of the world. And uh, he breaks down a little bit about New Age, but it's interesting how – We'll get into a little bit later how a lot of uh, religions overlap because they're doctrines of demons. Um, but let's break down what New Age is. How would you get into it? Because I know you actually moved up the ladder in, in New Age and became a teacher of it. Yep. Tell us a little bit about wh- um, how you got into it and what, what it's all about. So I moved back to Los Angeles after four months in Tahoe, deciding I'm tired of freezing <laughs> and I want to get back to L.A. and try to get my life back together. And I listened to... Um, the local rock station, KLOS, mm-hmm. one Sunday night. I mean, I was growing up on rock and roll and, and uh, uh, Zeppelin, my first. The best concert I ever went to was Zeppelin. Worst concert I ever went to was Zeppelin <laughs> before and after. You know, early on they were great. <laughs> latter, latter album presence, they were all messed up. And So anyway, so I grew up listening to rock and roll and I'm listening to KLOS. Yeah. On a Sunday night I hear some guy with this really deep voice and he says, motorcycle crashes can be transformational. And mm. he had my ear immediately. Right. Because I just had my life turned upside down. I mm. survived something I knew I shouldn't have. So I started listening to him. He announces he's going to do a lecture the next night. So I find out where. I go to his lecture. And I began to really listen to this guy and listen to his show and go to lectures. And as it turned out... He was a huge New Age teacher. Now, New Age is, simply put, it's a doctrine that's fast and loose. It's the biggest church in America, the church itself, and it's all about love. Coexist bumper stickers were popular a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. Not so much these days, but it's like truth in all religions. All paths lead to God. You're spiritual, but not religious. And as long as it's about love and service and becoming better as a person in humanity, all good. You know, you hear the expression, God is love, right. God's children. So New Age is a number of different areas under the umbrella of ultimate goal. As an individual, mm-hmm. you can become self-actualized. You can become the best that you can. You know, you hear a lot about human potential. You know, what's our potential as human beings? And we only use a small percentage of our brain. So it's all about becoming almost godlike. Godlike here. And I'll be honest with you, when I got in and I became a teacher 21 years later, the last thing I ever thought about was the demonic realm mm. or this is really bad stuff. I just kind of couched it under spirituality, and I did lectures and seminars and lots of people. But looking back on it, I didn't like the word sin, Mm -hmm. right? I was raised uh, in in the Catholic faith, walked away in high school, said I would never, ever go back to church, and I'm in the world and doing this whole thing. But I look back on it now, and the enemy is so 
slick, mm. so seductive. And the New Age movement really appeals to that part of you that wants to kind of find meaning in life. Yeah. Right. But it's all about you. There's no absolute God. It's all about relativism. There is no absolute truth. Ryan, what's true for you? Fine. I don't agree. What's true for me? We honor each other. You know, no that's good. way. That's crazy. And that's all of New yeah. Age. It's fast and loose. It so works wh- for everyone. What I was going to ask you, and he almost answered it right now, like why is it so attractive to people? But I guess the answer is because it's very self-absorbed. We're in a self-absorbed Anything society. works. That's the bottom line. It's, you know, we live in a culture. That's all about self, filling, you know, self-esteem, self-worth, mm-hmm. selfishness. And so, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, it's appealing because it gives you the opportunity to just spend time thinking all about you. For me, my <laughs> life crazy. was all about me. Yes. I would do lectures and it was all about my ego. People would say, you're amazing. LA Times did a, a, a story on me. They called me a new age guru. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, check me out. Yeah. And all that was, I didn't really want to stop long enough at the time to spend time really thinking about it. But all that was, was trying to fill that void right. in my life that only God can fill. Mm-hmm. And I was on a fast track to just trying to fill up that pain with the world and with the flesh and with people versus with God. And every time you try and fill yourself with that stuff, just like us trying to fill that that fleshly desires, you get empty. Yeah. You have to keep filling it over and over and over. And when you said uh, New Age is about do do what you want, it's all about you, I thought about that quote that Aleister Crowley said, do as thou wilt. Right. I mean, if you take it all the way back to one of the most evil men in the world that sure. introduced witchcraft back into the scene after the Egyptians were messing around with it, uh, his quote was, do as thou wilt. So it's, it's, it's all, it, it all ties in, you know, and, and Satan got kicked out of heaven because he says, I'm going to send higher than the most high God. You know, I'll, I'll be like God. I want to be like God. It's all about I, I, I. And you know, one thing that's crazy and interesting that, that he brought up as far as all the different kind of, you know, religions and philosophies that are mixed into it, but it's a trip because, but what it does, it ostracizes Christianity out of it. Mm -hmm. Because you can bring in, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism and this kind of philosophy. And some of the stuff that you're saying right now is actually a mix of like secular humanism. You know, it's all mixed in together. And yet Christianity, it's out. Yeah, I remember I hearing you say something like somebody bring you a Bible or something like that. That would be something that you would reject. Why is that? It when is, you're in. yeah, it, it, I used to hang up on Christians. People would call my <laughs> show, my spiritual show, and I would say, we don't talk religion. But at the time, truth be told, I was all about the Dalai Lama and mm-hmm. Buddhism because you chant to nothing. I mean, you know, that's the lore of Buddhism. But when someone would call and try to share the gospel with me and I would get upset, the truth of it is now that I understand is Jesus said, the only way to the Father is through me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And as a New Ager, I would hear that and I would think, how intolerant is Christianity right. to Narrow. say somehow Jesus is the only way? Mm-hmm. So I was bent on living for me. And as Billy Graham once said, the cross is offensive mm-hmm. because it causes you to choose one way or another. And because I was so steeped in myself and my mm-hmm. way, I wanted nothing to do with that until a number of years later when, we'll we'll share the story, when I came to know Christ as my Lord and Savior, which is a crazy story. Okay, so now as we're talking about New Age, there's there's different levels of it, right? So when you first got in it, peace, love, it's all about me. But then when you started getting into higher ranks, you got into like, I think it's called astral travel or astral projection. What's what's Tell us a little bit about all that. We made a great effort to spell it all out in the book. All the different degrees, all the different aspects of New Age are in my book. Um, But yeah, astral projection is being able to or attempt to uh, put your thoughts out, leave your body, go somewhere else. Astral projection, same kind of thing. There's different ways, but it all stems from Mm. when we when we think about use the word meditation. Yes. Be careful. Because I was probably, if anything, I was proficient at teaching meditation, which is clearing your mind, monitoring your breath, 
kind of going into this place of just emptiness. Mm -hmm. And if anyone listening knows anything about the truth in the Bible, about uh, spiritual realms, when you empty yourself into emptiness, you're just like opening portals and doors to demonic activity. And because of Hollywood... People that don't really know, they think of demonic activity as all that exorcist, booga booga stuff. Mm -hmm. When the truth is, demonic activity can be just eh, kind of more plain, um, all the way to really troubling dark stuff. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was in all that. I I taught meditation. Uh, You mentioned astral projection. You were telling me one time about something about some people you guys were working with, one guy was in London, or there was a book in London yeah. locked up. Yeah. Tell, tell us a little bit about That's that. That's called remote viewing. How, yeah, how does there that was, work? There was a, uh, a society called the Mobius Society. I don't know if they're in existence mm-hmm. anymore, but they would lock... This is the story. Mm-hmm. Now, how can you prove this? I don't know, but I was hook, line, and sinker into mm-hmm. the new age. Uh, they lock a guy in a vault. They've got a book, and he's supposedly reading a book. And then there's a dude somewhere on the other side of the world who claims to be able to uh, remote view into this guy's vault and read the book as well. Mm-hmm. And so, look, I, I, I have to say I was gullible. I was desperate for uh, all this stuff. And, and the enemy just twists you all around. Oh, yeah. I mean, all truth be told— I wasn't really that bad of a guy. It's not like I I was going out in the world and and ripping off people and and had this scam going or doing that. But sin is sin. Mm -hmm. You know, if you lie, if you deceive yourself, I mean, it's all the same thing. So I didn't realize it, but whether it's remote viewing or whether it's just living your life for you and saying, hey, it's all about love. If you're not grounded in the truth of the Word of God, um, it, like atheism, what's that? You have no moral compass. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you look, we, we know when it's about self, we can do all sorts of things. And I just look back on my life and I could I could wreck my life without thinking twice. I mean, I had I did immoral things. I, I did all sorts of stuff, but in my head I was thinking, I'm a teacher. I'm okay. I'm a good guy because I'm talking all about right. love. Mm-hmm. Justifying everything. Yeah. Justifying and, and, and Satan's the everything. king of that. Mm-hmm. When oh, you're yeah. when you're wrapped up in sin, you could justify anything. It's true. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's true. A, a million different ways. Cool. So you're 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 a guru in this in new age. And when did you get um, a job over at uh, KLOS? Uh, when I came back to L.A. after my bike crash, this guy that I listened to on the radio that I got involved with, I interned with him. I started working with him at KLOS, and uh, about 18 months after I got this internship, uh, I ended up taking over his show uh, and lied about everything. You know, program director, you have radio experience? Oh, yeah, I took it in college. <laughs> And then shortly thereafter, they asked me if I ever jocked, played music. Oh, oh yes. yes. <laughs> in college. And I'm Faking you know, it to make it. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I was news director, sports director, jock. I never had any experience in radio. And I started in KLOS in 85, and I spent 27 years at that station. And eventually took over the talk show in 87 and did that talk show for 21 years until um, they, they actually kicked me loose on the talk show. And later that year is when I found Christ, which is a story we need to get into. We're, we're, uh, get, we're getting in that for sure. Okay, so uh, one, 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 um, now that we're going to get into talk how you found Jesus, um, you were uh, you had a cool, you had a conversation with Ozzy Osbourne. I did. Yeah, tell tell me a little bit about that because that's that's pretty interesting. When you told me that. I um, let's see uh, a number of years after I worked at KLOS. Uh, The morning show, popular morning show, Mark and Brian, they were on for 25 years. My program director asked me if I would work on the show because she ended up becoming the boss and her position opened up. Mm -hmm. And I had done news with the guys, but eventually, uh, after I said no a number of times, I started working with them. So I was on this morning show as the sound engineer in the studio with Mark and Brian, the three of us. The fourth on-air personality was our news person, and she was in another studio. 
But they would have guests on in the studio, so it would be us three and the guest. Right. Right? Now, where my position was on the board, the guests always sat opposite me. And we would have actors on. We would have rock and rollers on. We'd have authors on. So one morning, Ozzy's going to be on. A few weeks before that, I became a Christian. Right. So I was on fire for the Lord. But Ozzy comes in, and he'd been on a few times before that. And I'm kind of the invisible guy. You know, it's Mark and Brian, and mm-hmm. sound engineer never says anything, especially right. when the guests are on. So we had a five-minute break. The guys always went outside to, I'll just say it, they, they would go out and smoke cigarettes, right. right? They go outside. So here's me and Ozzy. I'm here. You're where Ozzy is. Yeah. And it's kind of quiet for about 30 seconds. And he strikes up a conversation with me. And we start talking about war, and he's all upset about war. Uh, It might have been at a time when we went back in the Gulf. I don't remember the timeline, but he's all upset. And he says, I hate war, and I I believe in peace and love and and this and that. And then he asked me, he says, do you believe in God? And I wanted to share my testimony, but I'm thinking we've got three minutes here. And I said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I said, do you believe in God? And Ozzy starts doing, you know, the stutter and the stammer, and he starts <laughs> telling me, you know, why I wear these crosses. You know, you know me. I'm the Prince of, of Darkness. Yeah. I'm the Prince of Darkness, yeah. you know, in that voice. And he said, I wear these crosses because I know there's a demonic realm, but I also know God is real, and I wear these crosses That's to protect trip. myself. Hmm. And then as he asked me again, so tell me about God. No way. I'm about to go into... Christianity and Jesus is my Lord and Savior, the guys walk in and I never got to have that conversation with them. Dude, him. that wow. is crazy. Yeah, I mean, I was telling you earlier that uh, I went to a Black Sabbath show. I felt like God, I had some friends that were going up there that weren't Christians and I felt like God was like leading me to go up there. You know, so I, I went up there and I showed up and when I got there, God opened these doors for me to reach out to some of my friends that I haven't seen in a long time. That opened this, they reopened this door for me to like hang out with these guys again. And then when I was sitting there, I remember seeing Ozzy and there was like crosses and the devils on all the speakers. And as he started, as I started listening to all the songs, I mean, he's reaching out like he believes in devils. He's reaching out to God. Do you exist? And it's this full war that's going on in his head. So I just started praying for him heavily, dude, at that time, just praying for that him, the band. And then God let me start praying for the whole crowd. And it's just, it's rad being in situations like that. When, because we're the salt of the earth, we're the light in the darkness, and that's what this whole whosoever movement is about. It's about going to the sinners and being that light in that dark place. Yep. I mean, when the room's dark, and you turn on the light, boom, the whole place lights up. So I started praying, and I know God obviously was working. I don't know, you know, what God was doing in those people's lives, but He had me there praying for them. And if you're listening, man, you got to lift up Ozzy. I mean, he's in a war, yeah, spiritual battle, absolutely, and there's a war for his soul. And, there's so much stuff. I mean, in, in the music industry and just in our culture, man, things are continuing getting darker and darker, but God is able to change any anyone's life. He's able to change and transform anyone. anyone. And like we were just talking about with Frank, where we're going to come on the other side of this break and finish the story of Frank Sontag. Make sure you stay listening because it's about to get gnarly. Peace. More live with Ryan Reese coming up. Is everything all right? Sure. Call now. 1-888-564-6173. Or post your questions using the hashtag Live Ryan Reese on his Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook. Uh, I think I speak for the entire administration when I say whoop de doo
now, back to live with Ryan Reese. Don't say what I warn you. Loud noises! We are back with uh, in studio. We have Frank Sontag. He's talking about his uh, ride through uh, New Age and now his exit. He's going to be talking about us, talking to us now about how he found Jesus. So what? What? How'd that go down? So I'm doing New Age for 21 years. I'm at KLOS, cruising along. Life's good. At least I thought life was good. Mm-hmm. Popular guy, uh, making you know lots of money, fame, fortune, all that stuff. And uh, one guy I hung out with who was my best friend, we were, uh, he used to go to my lectures as a new ager. And we would hang out and do all st- sorts of stuff we don't need to talk about on the air, but let's yeah. just say we wouldn't talk about what we were doing. And we would <laughs> sin together. We hung out, spent a lot of time together. And um, all of a sudden, a few years later, in 2006, he gives his life to Christ. Now, up until that point, I'm teaching the New Age. I right. meet my wife at a New Age seminar in, in uh, 2000. We marry in 2004. We're New Agers, soulmates. New Age is all over my life. I'm a teacher. A couple years later, after I got married, my best friend gives his life to Christ. But he never pushes anything on me. He never preaches. He never proselytizes. And um, I just saw instant change in him. Hmm. This guy chain smoked. He stopped smoking almost instantaneously. He would drop F-bombs like a sailor. Never heard him swear. Um, He had substance abuse struggles. Right. uh, In a matter of just a short time. That all went away, too. What were you thinking? Okay, when you've seen these things, what were you thinking? Like, what was I thinking or what did I not want to (laughs) think? What did you not want to think? I didn't want (laughs) to think that this Christianity thing was real. Yeah. So I did everything I could to push that out of my head, and what I was thinking was, okay, that's nice. You know, if it works for him, great, but I'm good where I'm at, mm-hmm. and I'm just seeing, uh, you know, the, the sky's the limit with my, my fame and everything else. Wait, wait really quick. I got yeah. a question. This is something I've never asked. Uh, when, you're, when you're a new ager, you know, we, when you're a Christian, you have the peace of the Holy Spirit. Yep. You have those encounters. Do you, do you have peace when you're a new age, or is it? You have moments where it's almost as if I'm there, but you never are quite there. Mm-hmm. You know, the whole story with Jesus at the well, mm-hmm. yep. give me some water. Right. Uh, your thirst will forever be satiated. It, it's almost like in New Age, um, it, the enemy just gives you a little bit Yes. to where you are looking for more. Right. Now, I had moments where I thought, I'm good. But within a, just a matter of a short period of time, that yearning, that question, there's got to be something more to this. Mm-hmm. There's something missing, would always come flooding back. Meantime, I'm a teacher, really pushing that stuff about meditation and about the new age, but I knew something wasn't right. So I watched my buddy um, give his life to Christ, and everything changes. He actually invited me to his baptism. He went to a church down here in O.C., I went to it. I'm not sure why I went, maybe Holy Spirit kind of prompting <laughs> yeah. me. But I remember seeing him and seeing his life change. So that spoke loud to me. And his older brother was a Christian pastor, evangelical pastor down here. He would call my show, and we would go button heads on the air about ideology and truth and what's life about. That's amazing. But the point of the story is these two brothers, biological brothers, loved me That's for key. three years never pushed anything on me, so I knew they loved me. So everything was cruising along till December of 2009. They invite me to play golf. And I'm thinking, fine, I played golf. Yeah. Little did I know, and I didn't know until we researched the book, they decided, because they had watched me just blow up in the new age, Right. they needed to corner me and share the gospel with me. So they picked up golf. Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here's Very how strategic. <laughs> yeah, here's how we're we're down here in, in Fullerton playing yeah. golf, and I'm on the third hole, and Pastor Dale, I, I don't know if I was on the fairway or the green, but he kind of drops a little bit. So, what problem do you have about Jesus Christ, Frank? And I'm like. We're not going there. What we're are you doing? We're trying to have a good time. We're trying to have a good time. <laughs> exactly. We're not going to have whoa, that conversation. Whoa, whoa. So that kind of happened for a little while. 
after nine holes, we said, let's go to lunch. So they, again, strategically had planned out, prayed about it for a long time that they were going to hit me at lunch. Mm -hmm. So we go to lunch. I order the burgers. We sit down. And they proceed to ask me the questions. Have you ever lied in your life? Have you ever stolen anything? Have you ever? And they're, they're getting me to realize that I've sinned. You know, right. they ask about the Ten Commandments. They're sharing the gospel with me. And I'm throwing new age back at them. That's nice for you. Look, I'm okay. I'm a spiritual guy. I'm a good guy. And as we went back and forth... The more we did this, the more they shared the word, we are guaranteed the word of God never returns void. Yes. When they shared, there was a part of me that began to hear my argument, and it was empty. Shallow. It was shallow. So I knew something was up. So instead of taking a moment, hmm. honoring that moment, and admitting that, what did I do? I got more defensive. Hmm. I talked more. Anyway, two hours later... Pastor Dale asked me the question that changed my life. He said, Frank, I don't mean to disrespect you. You're a spiritual guy, all that stuff. You've got a wife. My son was born a year and a half before that. you got a beautiful son at home. You bought a beautiful house at the height of the real estate market and ended up <laughs> crashing and losing any other man's beautiful uh, insights into supposedly we can figure things out. Anyway, he says, uh, you have a wife, a, a son, a house job you're popular are you right with god that's interesting and i said i was offended i said of course i'm right with god i'm a spiritual teacher i almost wanted to pull out the la times article to say you know look, yeah, you're yeah, right. I'm, I'm a, a big deal yeah right exactly <laughs> so he said as a friend would you do us a favor would you sit in your car and he kind of said meditate with the the quotes around right you know, would you meditate on that? And because I was kind of, if I was anything, I was a Buddhist. That's, he was a little jab at me, a little loving jab, meditate on it. I kind of said, fine. So we talk a little while longer, and I'm in my car. I put the key in the ignition. I'm about to turn it, and it was almost like, oh, that's right. Okay, I love these guys. They love me. I'm going to sit in my car and do what Dale said. So <laughs> that's I, crazy. I sit in my car, and I go to level. I meditate. I clear my head. I go quiet. I, I, I'm monitoring my breathing. And I started to get really hot. And I'm like, uh, what's up with that? Am I sick? Do I have a fever? No, I'm fine. Now, when I tell you what happened, I want to preface it by saying, as a new age teacher, I read a lot of holy books by the world standards. I read the Quran. I read the Bhagavad Gita. I read the Upanishads, Eastern mysticism books. But I never have opened a Bible in my life up until that point. Hmm. You wouldn't know by listening to my show, I would slam the Bible. Yeah. You know, lying is so seductive. The enemy has you. Yeah. I'm just hammering the Bible. It's not the Word of God, man's interpretation, written many times. Christians would call me, share the guy hanging up on them. So I'm like out on Christianity. Never opened a Bible. But I read all these other books. About the Bible. Or, or I mean, you, I mean, how, how could you talk so much trash about the Bible and you've never even read it? It's just, it's just lies. How can you talk trash in the world? Lies where you know nothing. Yeah. It's easy right. to do. Yeah. It's you, Once you start going down that road, you can say, hey, I was a movie star. I was a pro basketball player. I was this. I was that. Yeah, it's true. People kind of cross check and they're like, no, you weren't. We have politicians. Oh, that yeah. Say they, you know, their See background, the they're in the military. We're not going to go on that, but they find <laughs> out never in the military. Yep. Right. You're the public eye like that. How can you do that? Because it's sin. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm in my car, nothing, know nothing about the Bible, and uh, I got very hot, and as clear as you can hear my voice, um, I heard, are you ready to submit to me? And I knew who it was. People have asked me, how did you know who it was? When your father, who made you, before you were ever even, uh, you know, thought about in this life, when he speaks to you, you recognize his voice. There's something seminal in all of us. You recognize your father. So when he asked me, are you ready to submit to me? I had a choice. I had free will. I could have said yes or no. I said yes. And then he said words I had no reference to. I never read the Bible. I knew nothing about Scripture. 
he said, pick up your cross and follow me. Dang, that's heavy. Well, I didn't know it was heavy at the time. In the last six years, man, do I know it's heavy (laughs) now that I know what it's about. So I just thought, okay, uh, whatever. Uh, It kind of went away after a few moments. The sensation went away. I call my buddies. And I start sharing, and they're hooting and hollering and praising God, and they're screaming. And I'm like, I told them, I want to go back to church. I hadn't been in a church in 37 years. Mm -hmm. When I said that, I knew something happened because I was instantly on fire for God. Here's one of the parts of the story that's a little gnarly. Uh, My dear, sweet, beautiful wife, we just celebrated our 10-year anniversary. Um, She sees on Facebook our good friend just gave his life to Christ. Now, she's a new ager with me. Right. That morning when I go to play golf, I'm driving home as a Christian. She's still a new ager. Yes. She sees that. I get home, and she was really upset. Really upset. See, that's... What happened to you? I don't talk to me. And we spent a really rough 18 months. She uh, spent some time away. The D word was dropped. Uh, My whole life fell apart. But here's the hook of the story. Pastor Dale had mailed me a Bible. And five weeks after this golf outing, um, the Bible comes. And this is what a good Christian I was five weeks later. I knew that red letters in the Bible meant that Jesus, those are his words. Mm -hmm. So I get my Bible. I'm opening the Bible one night when it comes on my knees, and Luke opens up to me, and I read Luke 9.23. Luke 9.23 is red letters, the words of Jesus Christ, and it's, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, pick up his cross daily, and follow me, I hit the ground. I said, that's it. I can't make that up in a million years. I got on my face and I said, I don't know what's happening to my life, but that is so undeniable. Lord, I I submit to you. I repent of my ways. I will follow you from this moment on as you give me breath. And I'm all in for Jesus Christ from that night on. And so that is how my walk as a Christian began. Um, You know, there's some other parts of the story maybe we can get into. But uh, bottom line, six years later, uh, I am so sold out for Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way. And to go from a guy that for 21 years peddled a New Age movement um, to saying what I say, um, I know it's true. I've seen what he's done in my life in the last six years, and it's undeniable. It's the real thing. You, You get the Holy Spirit encounter, and God just starts moving in your life. What was uh, what was some of the now that you found God, people that are listening, you know maybe they want to give their life to Christ tonight after hearing this story. Um, how do you like first of all what when you gave your life to God? What were the um, the ups and downs of of following God? Like what was the what was your journey to where you're at now? It's a great question. Some people um, think that giving your life to Christ is a life insurance policy. I want to make sure everything is good. <laughs> so in this moment, I'm gonna see, right? right? Yes, and they see, and it's not like your life necessarily gets better or Sometimes easier. Sometimes it can get worse. Oh. I mean, as far as your day in, day out life, check Absolutely. it out because yeah. you now you're dealing with stuff straight on. Yeah, I lost everything. I often joke at churches, you know, all of you that give your life to Christ, you know how great everything got after that moment. Everybody laughs because most of the time that begins the sanctification process right. where God really starts honing you. Yeah, for me. My wife left for a while. That, I, which is huge. I mean, uh, right when you accept the Lord, boom, your wife. I lost my job. I lost my house. I lost everything I had. But I was so solidified in my faith, I'm like, Lord, I trust you. Right. I trust you. Just show me today how I can serve you, how I can give you glory. What can I do? And people are like, dude, you know, your life's falling apart. You, are you, you lost your mind? What's yeah. the deal? And I'm like, I'm all in for Christ. Let me share about him. So I shared. But the ups and downs, some of the things that happened, um, lost my job uh, th- after 27 years, thought I was done with radio. Um, in about a uh, number of months after this happened, my wife says, look, I, I, I can't stand you, but we have a son. And so you're on the couch, 
and I'm upstairs, don't talk to me, and we started going to counseling. Dude, that's gnarly. I leaned on the elders in the church. I'm like, this is really hard. Yeah. And they're like, well, welcome to the Christian mm-hmm. walk. It's not easy, but you have been given a gift to love your wife like Christ loved the church. And they were emphatic about saying, just tell your wife, your marriage can work. God has a plan. You love her. And I did that for months and months, mm-hmm. even though things were not good. One morning I wake up on a Sunday morning. She says, I, I want to go to church with you today. And I almost, you know, start screaming, but I had to be cool. Yeah. So we drive up to my church and it was great. And on the way home, she says, that was, that was not what I expected. That was really good, but I don't buy the Jesus thing at all. Mm-hmm. She also was raised Catholic, walked away from the church. So well, she's already kind of jaded by the, the, the Catholicism. And that's, it, it's kind of a, a interesting side hook to the New Age movement. Lots of folks walk away from the church, Catholicism, and they get hooked in New Age because it is a search. It is a quest for meaning. Mm-hmm. But the problem is it goes from being pointed to God and the point comes back on you and then mm. becomes all about self-obsession. And that's easy to buy into. Simple. Oh, oh, absolutely. Everyone loves that. Oh, you got it. Yeah. So she starts going to church with me. Um, and in July of 2011, she gave her life to Christ. Amazing. And he's redeemed everything. Um, probably the last part of the story, uh, I was out of radio. I met a man named Frank Pastore who hosted a a radical Christian show in Southern California for almost 10 years in the afternoons on KKLA. And in April of 2012, he invited me on his program. I had put on YouTube uh, two video clips of my conversion, not my testimony, but just my my conversion. Because all my New Age people, I stopped talking. They wanted to know what happened to me. So what what was it titled on YouTube? Uh, I don't remember. Just Frank Sontag. Two okay. parts, but it's a casual conversation. One of my rock and roll buddies who has a uh, 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 recording studio in Hollywood says, you got to put something up. So he did it so for me. Know, yeah. He did everything. So Pastore sees it, invites me on the show. Wait, how, how did he find it? Some listener that listened to me at KLOS said, I think Frank might have said, you know, if you know any good stories. Or, oh, gotcha. Yeah. So he, he uh, threw it out there, and Frank kind of checked out the clips and inquired and invites me on the show. So I walk on Pastore's show and instantly love this dude. He's a psycho. I love him. <laughs> uh, man, same hairstyle. We're Italian. We got a lot in common. Really? <laughs> so after an hour, I do the show. I give my public testimony like I just shared yeah. for the first time ever. I never talked about it publicly. I told the, the listeners in L.A. radio that God talked to me, you know. Yeah. So I'm driving home, and boy, the enemy's really working on me. Oh, Dude, yeah. you just told everybody you're crazy. <laughs> Nobody's going to believe anything, all that stuff. But Pastore and I established a relationship. Um, I was on his show again a few months later with my wife, talking about uh, new life in Christ, struggles from a non-believing marriage to new life in Christ. And I was on a third time right after I got let go at KLOS. I got let go in August of 2012. Uh, after 27 years, uh, seven minutes after the morning show ended, they fired everybody, even though they told us all we had jobs. Wow. So that's a fun time. It's all in the book. Yeah. So a um, few months go by. I'm unemployed. Uh, we lose our house. We're in the middle of a farm in, in Ojai. And my wife's looking at me like, what are you going to do? We got a son. Hey, yeah. man of the house, <laughs> yeah. get out there. And I'm trying everything. And I'm watching it all go. No, dude, you know, right. I'm, I'm a middle-aged dude. Ain't like people are banging the door to give right. me a job in radio. Here's the last part of the story. So in September 2012, I go to KKLA, and I uh, kind of shared my testimony, talked to the bosses, and they're like, you know, w- we love you, but there's nothing here. And I saw Pastore that day, and as he walked by, he jokingly said, you're not taking my job. Jokingly. <laughs> jokingly. He goes on the air. A month later... Um, or about a month and a half later, he goes on the air and starts talking about, he was a motorcycle rider. Mm -hmm. He tells the L.A. listening audience, y'all know I ride a motorcycle. At any time after I get off work, 
I can be riding home on the 210 freeway in the carpool yeah, lane. I remember this Some story. idiot can take me out, and that's not me. That's my body, and I go on to eternity in Christ. Uh, 90 minutes after November the 19th, this final broadcast, uh, he is on the 210 freeway in the carpool lane. Somebody takes him out, and uh, he's in a coma for 28 days and goes home to Christ on December the 17th. Now, here's the last part of the story. And I always save this, and it's in the book, because Frank Pastore was a brother in Christ. Yeah. And uh, just, uh, you, you were on his show. You knew Did, Frank really well. I was the, you know what's interesting? That was the first radio show I was on. Is that right? Two. Oh, yeah. First time I got, told my story on the radio was uh, on the Frank Pastore show. Wow. Crazy. Well, Frank told me, the first time I met him after the show, he looked at me and he said, you're going to take over my show. And I thought that was a weird thing to say. I didn't think twice about it. When my wife and I were back on three months later, um, I found out after the fact through his wife. Uh, he comes home, and his wife's name is Gina, wonderful woman. She actually has an, a show on KKLA now on Saturday nights. Mm -hmm. He comes home and says, honey, I'm home. Did you hear the show today with Frank? And she joked with him and said, you made his wife go on the air. And he said, well, kind of. And, and then he says, he's going to take over my show. And really? And she wow. says, what are you talking about? Are you retiring? And he said, no, he's older than me. And they kind of laughed. And it was never <laughs> brought up again. <laughs> that's really? a trip. So, Dude, that's crazy. So he goes down on his bike. He passes. Mm -hmm. They call me. I start filling in. Seven months later, I took over his show. And here's the last part. My conversion to Christ was December the 17th, 2012, or 2009. Frank passed away December the 17th, 2012, three years to the day I gave my life to Christ. Dude, wow. that's crazy. We had a lot of interesting similarities, and, and that brother, I miss him every day. I sit yeah. in that studio. We got photos in the book of him. I, I really wanted to honor and revere him, and uh, that brother— um, boy, the Lord really must have needed him in heaven because we we still need him here. I know, I know. We we uh in our new movie that just came out, the three who started three sixty five. We actually at the very end of the movie, um, I got to get you one of those movies too. By the way, please. Um, at the end of the movie, we actually do a credit. We have a picture of him and it says, you know, in memory of Frank Pastore, because that that was during that time when when he passed away was when we were making that movie and he that you know just to give honor to him, man. That that guy took a, a, a chance on bringing me on the radio show with him and, and just he heard me speak one time. I was totally rough around the edges and uh, he had me come on and tell my story. And, and he really opened a lot of, a di God used him to open a lot of different doors uh, for me and even with you. And yeah, it, absolutely. Dude, it's amazing. For those that don't know who Frank Pastore was, he was a professional baseball player with the Cincinnati Reds in the 80s. He was an atheist. He hated Christians. He thought they were a bunch of nut jobs who were weak. <laughs> Um, yep. He gets knocked, uh, his, his arm gets shattered at Dodger Stadium in June of 84, same month of my motorcycle crash, and uh, the, the Christian ball players start loving on him. And he's like, you guys, just whatever. He ended up finding Christ, then ended up getting into radio, and uh, his testimony, radical too, atheist, hating Christians to hosting this program that uh, I took over two years ago. And... Uh, just humbled and grateful to be able to do this afternoon show and, and share the gospel with everybody because everybody needs a Savior, and we know who that Savior is. Do you have any uh, last words for the listeners? If anybody's listening to this broadcast and uh, if any of it really kind of hits you, all I can tell you is in the Word of God, we are assured that if you ask Jesus Christ into your life, even if you don't necessarily believe he exists, you just ask him in, he'll make himself known to you. And I'm praying there may be one person right now that's just up against it that uh, is at a point in their life where they can't do it anymore. Um, ask him into your life. Um, and he will reveal himself to you. And I, I just pray for, for the Holy Spirit to just... Uh, minister to you. Um, my prayer is that you will find um, him um, through Christianity and uh, start reading the Bible, uh, start listening to powerful shows like this. Actually, there's no show like this. Keep tuned in to Ryan and company and uh, 
and just pray, Lord, I need a Savior. Please come into my life. I'm a sinner. I want to change my life through you. And you know what? There's that one verse, seeking you will find, knocking the door will be open. That's right. He'll, uh, he'll show up at, at, in your car. <laughs> you were in your car. Yep. Um, I was in a hotel room. Um, Sean, where were you when you found you gave your life to the Lord? Dude, you were I was in a church. Yeah, I was going through a lot of stuff. You know, I was battling with um, the DUI that I was going through and everything. Mm-hmm. And then I saw the Passion of the Christ movie spoke volumes to me. And I just started reading the Bible. Same thing. I was more into like getting into psychology and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And then it was just the emptiness of life. I started reading the Bible at a jacked up time, and the Bible just started coming to life to me. You know, one thing that Frank said earlier that scripture that he's talking about that the Lord spoke to him deny self, yeah. submit to me. You know, no, what's so powerful about that? Jesus says, if you want to try to save your life, okay. you're going to lose it. Yeah. But if you lose your life for my sake, you find it. Actually, you find the essence of life. That's People right. think like they're just throwing in the cards, they're going to give their life to the Lord, and then nothing's mm-hmm. going to happen with their life. I used, That was the thing I used to think. I'm like, well, Christians, I mean, I know some of them are cool. My mom's a Christian and stuff, but I'm like, but they lose their individuality. Mm-hmm. And then that's what was like a, a downer for me. But in essence, you find true life. I used to think, man, I got the life. I have everything that I possibly want. My parent, my dad would say, Ryan, you need to give your life to the Lord. Uh, he, has, he has a plan for you. I'm like, dude, I got the life. <laughs> that's right. You know, you get the life when you deny your life. Amen. And you give it to Jesus Christ. Thank you, Frank, for being on the show. Thank you, yep. man. All right, guys. Peace out. This has been Live with Ryan Reese. To connect or find out more about Ryan, click on ryan-reese.com. Check us out next Saturday at 9 p.m. for Live with Ryan Reese.